and I'm going to prepare it for the Facebook Live. And we will start at 6.02. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, Donna. And I see Roxana. Welcome. Gina. you guys remember those old tune the pioneers Welcome, Miss Powell. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> Just coming from a walk, rush back to come and catch this. <laughs> yes. Hi, Sonia. <laughs> Andrew, how long is this um, presentation? One hour. Okay, because I have another meeting. <clears throat> now we're going live on Facebook. Great. then we can share it um, on various platforms. <clears throat> want to welcome welcome everyone to 
our first series of food security and nutrition, the diaspora and Caribbean agenda. And we're so happy to have with us our guest speakers and our community partner. First, I want to acknowledge Paulette Sab Cyrus Burnett from, she's the founder of Global Food Warriors. Hello, and thank you for having me, Andrew. So looking forward to this discussion. Great, Colette. It's a pleasure to be partnering with Global Food Warriors to, you know, address this vital, vital, important issue of food security, Absolutely. and es especially in COVID-19. Yes. We want, we want to acknowledge um, Professor Dr. Lloyd Webb, who is a professor of public health at Tuskegee, Tuskegee, Tuskegee. University. Yes. <laughs> Most people get problems, don't worry. <laughs> it's my pleasure. <laughs> Great to have you. And uh, our nutritionist, our Sonia Grant, will be talking about nutrition. You know, in these times are very important, especially in COVID, the way we eat, you know, so forth. So, Sonia, happy to have you. Sonia can unmute. <laughs> You would think I would know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Welcome, Sonia. Thank you. Great. I'm, I'm so excited that um, once again, we in the diaspora doing great work. And um, I want to acknowledge my um, team member also is on the call, um, Donna Fret, And she's from the islands of the British Virgin Islands. And I want Hi everyone, to, thanks for being here. Thanks, and I want to acknowledge all the diaspora members who are on the call from the Jamaica diaspora Northeast, um, Claudette Powell and many others, or Michael on, and many others who is, who is with us. So we have a great, and we wanna acknowledge our Facebook viewer who are watching us live on Facebook and we're, we're happy to be informing our diaspora um, the importance of mm -hmm. food security and nutrition. Um, I'll just right. give you a brief about the Authentic Caribbean Foundation, who we are, a nonprofit 501c3, who has actioned the call to advance and advocate for Caribbean American diaspora community here in Massachusetts with our specialty in kids with disabilities, special, ed, special needs kids who are the vulnerable one in these times. And they also will um, be affected by food security and nutrition. So we're so happy to, to be able to provide such support and services for kids with disability and to be able to, um, you know, look after their me, um, programs, the involving programs, um, provide needed supplies and so forth. Um, we did back to school drive. Um, we did many, many other stuff. So we're so excited that um, as a foundation, as we keep growing and we keep doing the people's work, I say, it's always the people's work. And we're happy to provide such assistance for those vulnerable um, in our community. So. I want to welcome everyone and thanks. Um, more information on the foundation can be obtained on our website, www.authenticcaribbeanfoundation.org. We're always looking for members who are committed to the cause of a strong Caribbean American diaspora community and a strong Caribbean region um, to support the cause and whatever your expertise we are open and willing to have you on board to help us grow and provide support for our community. It's with great pleasure that I hand it over to the CEO founder, Colette Cyrus Barnett from the Global Food Warrior. Colette. 
the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew. Good evening again. Good evening, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, Authentic Caribbean and Andrew, particularly for doing this. For the esteemed panel, I thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today. My name, again, is Colette Cyrus Burnett, but I'm also known as a global food warrior. Today, I'm here to discuss our region's ability to achieve food security. For us to understand the opportunity before us, I'd like to take us back to come forward, as they say in Trinidad and Tobago. See, back in 1960s, the countries of our region were, for the most part, food secure. We could feed all of our people every day with healthily, locally grown food. Fast forward to today, our Caribbean region imports approximately 80% of our now Americanized diet. With a food import bill that comes out of the region topping 6.1 billion US dollars this past year. So if we're talking about today, we must talk about the fact that we sit in the midst of a global pandemic. Food supply chains across the world have been severely disrupted and so much so that we see farmers who have to destroy their crops as there are no workers available to reap. Perishables are perishing as people around the world empty, see empty grocery shelves and long lines that scream hunger and lack, the likes of which we are not yet completely aware. The economic impact of this pandemic will only become slightly visible by the end of this quarter of 2020. The World Health Organization released a statement last month that read, instead of the coronavirus, it's the hunger that will kill us. A global food crisis looms. The world has never faced a hunger emergency like this, and experts are alarmed that they can see double the number of people facing acute hunger to 265 million by the end of this year. If that doesn't alarm you, then it should. We in the Caribbean happen to have the best climate for growing food. With the year-round sun, and that always allows us to consistently be in growth mode, we couldn't be more well positioned to pivot right here so that our country's GDPs might focus our efforts on agriculture, specifically focused on the youths. One of the best lessons that I learned the very hard way while I was in the heights of my own business's success, it is that it's not only how much you make, it's actually how much you keep as well. So I'm here to truly ask the leaders of our community, of our diaspora, to keep our people, to keep our money internal by focusing on building our agricultural pursuits, to first feed 100% of our people's needs and, save it, and then to save our 6.1 billion US dollars with an eye to exporting in the not too distant, distant future. My organization, Global Food Warrior, represents the disruptive space of vertical farming. That includes growing fish and plants in climate controlled environments built to maximize the yields in the smallest land spaces that might be available. We have found a way to grow food in urban spaces with significantly larger yields than what traditional farming might allow. We can indeed grow up to nine times as, as much food in the same square footage as traditional farming would allow. Currently in New York City, we have activated a school agricultural project in which we find the food deserts where children are not able to find affordable, accessible, and safe food. We install our vertical farms there on school property, with climate, which is climate controlled, and in New York City, we can now grow strawberries in the middle of winter. Mm -hmm. Similarly, vertical grow houses in the Caribbean can be much larger, and they can be built to serve instead of a school, it can serve a county or a village or even a city. It depends on the size that we build. See, the fact is this pandemic has exposed us to the vulnerable place that we have allowed ourselves to become lulled into by not controlling our own food supply. This pandemic is forcing us to become keenly aware of the benefits of localizing our food. And that can be a blessing if we can act fast and address it. Let's find, <clears throat> it is my hope that we can find ways to work with local NGOs on the ground in our respective islands to find custom solutions for each community or each nation. Fixing this challenge of food security will take breaking the mold and rebuilding a new reality that truly honors the role of agriculture and the farmers who feed us and the youths who need us. I can be reached at globalfoodwarrior.com or on LinkedIn as Colette Burnett if I could be of service to any of you in the future. For me, it is that, that important that we address this now. So I will turn over the time to Dr. Lloyd Webb, 
of Tuskegee University, who is a fellow Islander and an industry expert whose heart is in food security as it pertains to public health. Dr. Webb, thank you. Thank you, uh, Colette and Ms. Burnett. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to share with you um, a presentation I've put together, and I hope that we can all see it clearly. Uh, let me first of all say very thank, uh, very um, much express my thanks to Ms. Colette Burnett um, and also Mr. Andrew Sharp for inviting me to participate in this uh, discussion. I think it's very important, and she has actually laid out um, for us a very good roadmap. To the ambassadors in, our, in joining us, I want to say that it's a pleasure to be with you and to all other participants. I've asked my graduate students uh, to actually join us. I hope they will. <laughs> um, but if they don't, we will still proceed, okay? Um, is everybody seeing my slide? Yes. All right, great. I'll try to see if I can put it in a, in a show mode. And I'm gonna to try to run through them. I know the time is not, we don't have a lot of time, but I just would like to share with you uh, some basic concepts. I've really decided I'll speak to the issue of food security as a public health requirement. Um, as a public health professional myself, first of all, I'm a veterinarian, so I'm an animal doctor. And of course I did my public health work at Johns Hopkins and now I'm in public health. So I teach public health in the broadest sense, not just from a veterinary perspective. Um, but when we look at food security, I think it's important for us to be able to recognize that when we talk about food security, we are speaking about the fact that all people at all times must have physical and e economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and their food preferences. That's very important, okay? So as, as, as Ms. Burnett outlined, there are some important issues regarding and the, the assurance that we have food. But in so doing, we must make sure that all people are being um, are affected in a positive way. Now, there are some interconnected components to food safety, and that's what I want to speak to you about. Um, when we look at food safety, we have to look at it under the umbrella that it must have availability, it must have accessibility, affordability, safety, and quality. And what does that mean to us? It means that we have, in terms of availability, we have to have an increase in micro enterprises. We have to encourage people to become involved in producing foods. That, that brings employment to them, and it also brings indirect employment to many others, because as we produce foods, then we have people who have got retail outlets and the gamut goes on and on, okay? When we talk about accessibility, we're talking about wholesaling and retailing foods, okay? And herein lies the, the, the whole issue under the guise of the, the COVID experience where we can enhance on things like our backyard gardening and school gardening, you know, um, where, we, where we really would be able to maximize the resources that we have. And, and so we also have to look at affordability. You know, we must be able to produce foods that are cheaper in cost. Now, what does that mean? It may mean a number of things to a number of people, but you know, we also have to ensure that the, the food is safe. We talk about in, in my food safety course, one of the courses I teach, we talk to our students about the fact that we talk about three different types of hazards that affect us. They are what you call microbiological hazards, or some people call them germs. We talk about chemical hazards, and then we talk about physical hazards. And then we have to look at the quality of the food, which is critically important because that is where we are talking about the nutritional value that the food would bring to us, okay? So we have to keep these things in mind. In addition, I would like to say that when we talk about the cost of food, cheap food, and this is a, a quote I took from, from the director of the Caribbean Food and Nutrition Institute, the former director, Dr. Fitzroy Henry, who is actually from Guyana. And he said, cheap food is not an end in itself, only the means to an end. The end must be better health and better quality of life. So whatever food we produce, you know, Ms. Burnett spoke about green foods, leafy foods, they must be in a position to be able to provide for better health and better quality of life. 
And so therefore, as we move forward, we realize that we have to hem around agriculture in our national development, okay? Now, we've always looked at agriculture in the, in the eyes of the authorities, the, the Ministry of Agriculture and so forth. They must guide the process, but we also have to get in our people involved in, in appreciating agriculture. It's more than a mundane task. Agriculture does a lot of things for us, you know, and I could speak, I'd give you a whole lecture on the importance of agriculture, you know, as it did to me, uh, you know, in, in my early days as a student, you know, uh, how it groomed me and helped me to be able to concentrate, you know, it's a lot of things that agriculture will do that are cross benefits, you know, besides just the food that we produce. Um, but we want to realize that there must be certain activities and support systems, and of course, there must be certain goals. And the goal coming out of this conference would be one of how we can actually embark upon food security. So we have to look at the fact that there are certain nutritional and developmental crises that we face. We face economic forces, socio sociocultural forces, environmental forces, and political forces. And this, 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 um, slide here is really designed to show that there are so many different things that comprise these crises that we face. And if we are not able to deal with them, especially in the Caribbean region where we are facing things like hurricanes and droughts and so forth, we can have serious challenges. And so I just wanted to think on that. Um, so we must have a rational for our strategy, okay? If, for instance, we know we have insufficient supplies of nutritious food, then how can we promote domestic production? How can we promote backyard and school gardening? How can we regulate imports of nutritious food? Okay. If we are talking about insufficient access to foods, we need to look at the promoting agricultural diversity, you know, so that we have nutritious foods that can meet the needs of everyone in our population and our society. We have to stimulate the population to increase the use of nutrition, nutritious foods. And you notice I put here, I, I was looking at a YouTube and I saw where they talk about recycling kitchen scraps. We could talk at length about that. If you go on YouTube, this is a fantastic, they talk about 10 ways of using kitchen scraps how we can take onions and cut it off and put it there and actually find it to help it to, to germinate and to, to create more onions. How we can do that with celery and things that we throw away, you know, the stalks and, and so forth. And then of course we have insufficient consumption uh, where we now need to encourage, you know, people to consume foods that are healthy. And of course, food safety, um, which is critically important. And here is where we have to increase the awareness of our consumers. So my question is, can Caribbean countries reduce, reduce high costs of food imports annually and still improve health of all people? And if I were to answer my own question, I would say, yes, we can, okay? We can, if production increases so that it supports um, our development at the national level, and if the food costs are controlled, then we can have consumption of healthy, nutritious foods. And then we can have a, a trade system put in place in which we can actually realize some goals that are nationally, regionally, and even internationally, okay? And so therefore, I, I, I want to, to challenge you to think of these things as you move through in the discussion. Um, we can have some consumption targets. We need to be able to ensure what are our staples, staples, sorry. We need to ensure that we have low fat foods. We need to encourage our, our population to reduce the sugar intake. And of course, use many fruits and vegetables. The thing about all of this, I know the time is short, but as I close, the thing about all of this is that if we really truly accept these issues, we can find that we can have a beautiful niche where we can actually begin to provide our own foods and become self-sustained. And so this is what I would like to challenge us as we move forward. Ambassadors, you have the, 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 the right, um, the, the leadership role in which you can guide us and guide some of our people 
so that they can become excited about all of these things. And then if all of us in the diaspora um, jump in, we will be able to make a contribution. So I want to thank you. This is my contact. I can be reached at lweber.tuskegee.edu. And of course, my telephone numbers are there. And I just want to thank you very much for the time. I hope uh, at least we can talk a little bit more about this as we move on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Webb. That was so good because it really highlighted so many other parts of the food security that is so important beyond our profitability. And also recognizing that there are ways that we can do so in very, very simple shifts. So thank you so much. Now we, may, we have um, a bit of information from Ambassador Sid, Sidney Colley from the, ambassador, um, the Embassy of the Bahamas. Ambassador, are you on? Andrew? No, I'm not seeing Ambassador. I'm going to check and see if he's here. I'll reach out That's to it. him just to That's see it. probably is the connection. Thank you. No problem. Would you like to proceed into... Um, any question and answers um, for if yeah anyone, for Dr. Webb yes. from if there's anyone with a question you can um, unmute and ask the question of Dr. Webb or myself. We'll be happy to help. Okay. As I say, is it as clear as mud? <laughs> <laughs> Just be that. <laughs> Doc, it must be that, Doctor Webb. Thank you so much. But um, Andrew, if you'd like to proceed, and if we we do have a second tech question and answer segment at the end of the at the end of our discussion, so if questions come up, please feel free to put them into the chat as well. We'll be happy to answer them. I expect Andrew is on checking on now. Thank master. you. Yes, you did. There. there you go. Mm -hmm. Root, there's a request from Miss Root. Jean, I'm sorry, from Root Library Foundation. Jean? Yes, my question, ahead, my question is I know um, you mentioned uh, something about um, establishing connections in the home country in order to start um, is thinking about making these sort of food hubs. How yes. do you suppose we start doing that in terms of, not in terms of making the connections, but in terms of educating the persons that are there to, um, to start this process? I can speak directly to what we are currently doing in Trinidad and Tobago. In one part of Trinidad where a Global Food Warrior is currently on the ground, we created a relationship with an NGO that has been extremely um, active in the community. So um, Ruth, you would know them because the people on the ground would also know them. So we inquired about the, the organization that would best fit what we intended to do, and then created a relationship where we can now teach the youths that are interested in agriculture by Zoom, sometimes um, Google Meet, where we meet and discuss things like permaculture. We discuss new ways of, um, of innovating around agriculture, just about everything from food scraps like Dr. Webb, spoke of and how we might be able to use that to feed our plants, but also how we might be able to create better, stronger relationships with the individuals who are already working in the communities. This industry is a large one and there are many farmers who need your help. And we have created farmer networks who are now speaking with us about what challenges they're having from, how, from growing to soil across the board. It is though that the relationship needs to be engaging in a way that allows for both the farmers to learn, but for us, as well as us to learn about what's happening back home. It isn't impossible. And especially because of COVID, it has allowed us to think of ways that are innovative, that we can also reach our, our people and help where we can. So I really appreciate that question, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Anyone else? It seems Ambassador will be log logging on shortly. Um, Andrew, if you'd like to take the floor to continue, as I know time is of the essence. Excellent. Thank you very, very much um, for
for this discussion. Um, no one else has any other questions that we would like to ask the panel before we welcome um, the ambassador will be with us. I know Crystal has a, her hand up. Crystal, you could proceed. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Crystal Kamehameha Pondrelli, and my question is directed towards um, Ms. Collette Sarah Bernard's um, presentation. I know you feel very strongly about youth involvement in agriculture. However, more so in Trinidad and Tobago, it seems to be a taboo, among, a taboo amongst the younger generation. How would you propose you get them involved in the agriculture industry? Because we know um, as it relates to our current situation, the importance of food security and youth involvement in terms of longevity of such a program. How do you intend to engage young people? And it's more education based, but picking the interest seeing that is actually a taboo for young people to be a part of um, agriculture in such a large scale project. That's my question. Thank you, Crystal. That's an important question, simply because it is it has all it has been a challenge to engage the youth. And I've been doing this now for six years, it has gotten no easier. I will tell you that one of the first places that we start is that we actually compensate the youths to come out and to learn and also be involved in our programs. It's very important that we address their actual needs. So to not to have them on a if it's a um, even if it's a stipend, it makes a difference how many young people we see show up for these events, but also to make it exciting. It has it has been that agriculture has been a bit of a, has had a bit of a stigma, being that everyone expects that it is hard to do it out in the hot sun, you know, it's only old people is do, is do um, agriculture or, grow far, or do farming. But Dr. Webb could talk a little bit about how that has impacted him in his youth. And I can tell you that all of the young people who are involved in the program and have been involved in the program in the past come back. 90% of them also decide to go home and learn or teach at their, in their family homes. They even grow in container gardens. I have seen young people who show up to our, um, to our classes with what they've grown. So proud of the fact that they have grown this from seed all the way through. It's a really, really rewarding um, way of work. And it also is really difficult to be difficult to be angry and a farmer. So we tend to find that we have very, very happy young people who are involved as well. It is a challenge to get them involved, yes, but I believe word of mouth is extremely important. And so we find that when we find youths amongst our, um, our, among our youth, that they are leaders themselves among them. And once we engage those leaders, we find that we are more successful to get the rest of them involved. So that's how we do it. Thank you for that. Excellent. We also have another um, question, and this is from the Embassy of Trinidad and Tobago, um, Rudy Trojan. Um, you could go ahead. I hope I'm pronouncing the last name correctly. Hi, good evening. Yes, thank you so much. And hi, Colette. It's, it's a really um, important discussion that you all are engaging in right now. And um, I'm happy to see that we, we've taken this on head first, the issue of food security and agriculture. So my question is really just to get some more information uh, from you, Colette, about the actual work of the Global Food Warriors. Um, because, you know, it's it seems like the work that you're doing is um, impactful and it's very relevant, um, especially in, in this time of a pandemic. So if you could just share with us um, some more details about, you know, exactly what um, your, your um, is it uh, your NGO? Yeah. Is it yeah. your, your organization does? Yeah. Just so that, you know, I could, you know, I could be a little bit clearer on, yeah. you know, what's been happening. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rudy. It's nice to see you and to have you. I will tell you that um, Global Food Warrior was started out of a real need when we started working in the uh, schools here in New York City and found that 10% of the young people going to school were going to school hungry. And over the course of six years, having taught them in school how to teach, um, how to make good food from um, teaching them how to cook, we decided to instead start teaching them how to grow and then cook. And so it was that we found that there's a need for us to diagnose 
first what is needed in the community. Each community is different. So what Global Food Warrior does is that we curate a program around the needs of the community that is most, um, is most of a priority. So we do so in urban spaces, particularly because localized food is extremely important. As you've um, seen through this pandemic, if the food can't get to us, then we can't eat it. So figuring how, how to make sure that our food is as close as even walking distance is extremely important because it could be the, the difference between life and death. So for us at Global Food Warrior is how do we hyper-localize food in a way that is customized to the community or the county that we go into. We work specifically with youth because it is that we have to make this sustainable. And the only way for this to be sustainable is for us to involve them on every level. So our youth program is extremely important to us. They lead us. We teach what their, what their actual needs are. We listen a lot. That is one of the ways that I believe that we have been extremely um, successful. It's because we actually take the time to listen to what their needs are before we diagnose what's necessary. So each, as I said before, each community is going to be different. So for example, in Trinidad and Tobago, Southeast Port of Spain has an absolutely different need than Toko would have. And so we find community members there who are really, really, um, they're very excited about the program and they themselves find it to be a priority and we partner with them. So it's not just us. And I have to say today, um, particular thanks to my team there in Trinidad and even here in New York City who have been with me for forever walking through this process. It isn't an easy one in any way, but it is it's not impossible. So I thank you and I, if there's any other questions that you might have, you can reach me through globalfoodwarrior.com as well. And um, any of our team members will be available to you to give you more details if that's necessary. Thanks, Rudy. Thanks very much. Thank you. I want to acknowledge Ambassador Sidney Coley from the Embassy of the Bahamas. Ambassador, we're so happy that you're joining us. Thank you, Andrew. It's good to be with you. Um, I'm glad you called me and reminded me. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, we are just um, having a discussion. We had started out, so we just wanted to get your um how food security has affected the Bahamas and how you guys are doing in terms of food security um, in the Bahamas. Thank you, Andrew. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, good, good evening to everyone who's listening. I believe COVID-19 uh, has impacted all developing countries, particularly small island developing states like islands in the Caribbean, the Bahamas being no exception. But before COVID-19, uh, the Bahamas as a as an archipelagic nation, uh, flat with water problems and topsoil problems, uh, and with about seven and a half million tourists visiting the country every year, which overwhelm our food and other resources. And the country has less than five, that the citizens are less than 500,000, just under 500,000 citizens. So it's almost 12 times as many visitors uh, in country uh, during any one year, as opposed to the, not the uh, citizenship. And so I am told, I was listening to the previous speaker uh, with connections in Trinidad and Tobago, I am told by my grandparents, who are all deceased now, that the farming and fishing, which took place in the Bahamas when they were in their uh, middle of their, their, their working life, they were able to produce uh, food in farms in and about the community to settle and take care of their daily needs. Uh, fish 
and produce. And most of those islands, uh, uh, remote islands, New Providence, Nassau, Grand Bahama, and Abaco, Bimini, and Exuma are the more famous islands uh, where everyone leave to go to look for work. And so many of those remoter islands that used to have a history of farming do not have a history of farming anymore. There was a time when the Bahamas exported net to make uh, tomatoes and cabbages and cucumbers and sweet potatoes and sweet peppers to Europe. Not on the scale that the rest of the Caribbean exported banana uh, to Europe, but on a very large scale, that doesn't happen anymore. Our import food bill is in the billions of dollars to feed ourselves and to feed the tourists. And uh, over the last, actually over the last electoral cycle, over the last five years, the government has been encouraging backyard farming. Subsistence farming still exists with rudimentary implements, very poor soil, very poor irrigation, slash and burn. But uh, those folks who still do it produce enough for their own consumption. Uh, we don't see where without major economic injection and uh, building capacity, and also uh, more focus on agriculture in school and in the colleges and universities and sharing of uh, expertise uh, ar across the region. We don't say in the near term that the Bahamas will ever be able to produce enough food to feed itself and to take care of its visitors. And so we, we import everything. But I must say, for the crops that are grown, a lot of the common crops that are found in the Caribbean, uh, in my estimation, those crops are much better. They taste better, the bananas taste better, the sweet potatoes taste better, the corn, uh, the pigeon peas, everything seems to have a different flavor from what we import. Uh, but our people, unless we can make farming sexy, our young people are not interested. Those who are going into science, the STEM education, are going more into technology and not technology related to food production and farming. And so that's an open question for the Bahamas. I'll stop there. That's an open question for the Bahamas, but the, and I imagine a portion of that also obtains in the rest of the Caribbean. Well, it's a question governments and particularly Bahamas government will have to be dealing with uh, into the future. Thank you, Andrew. Well, thank you, Ambassador. Um, anyone has any question for the Ambassador? I do. I wondered, Ambassador Colley, um, given that it is that you are more or less in the same position as the rest of the Caribbean, um, one of the things that you mentioned in your discussion, you said that there is a need for us to share data, which is absolutely true amongst the region. Do you want, can you shed some light on why that that hasn't happened thus far as you, from your own knowledge? Because it seems to be one of the simplest things for us to share best practices amongst us. We, we share the same type of climate and some of the same challenges and when and we have discussions such as this, which I've been involved in so many of them, um, it comes across that we are essentially dealing with the same problem. And uh, so why are we not aggregating our information in such a way that we can use this information to better our outcome? Well, I believe from, from the Bahamas perspective, um, one of the natural drawbacks is the lack of fertile soil in abundance, the lack of a fresh water. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not an absolute impediment. For decades, the Bahamas government has been paying lip service 
self-sufficiency, food production, and food security. Yeah. And in fairness to um, the Penland administration, uh, he has been deceased now for about 15 years, but he's been in power for 25 years, five consecutive terms. In, fair, in fairness to his administration, he did make a real effort by giving out crown land <coughs> to young people who wanted to go to the family islands, mm -hmm. uh, up to five, 10 acres of land uh, to try their hand. Mm -hmm. The folly of that plan was there was very little capital provided. There was only rudimentary education. There was a farm store in the capital and there were um, farmer's market mm -hmm. a, a, across the out islands. But there's very little education, very little mechanization or, or technology applied. Uh, uh, no, no education for laborers, tilling the soil, irrigating, planting, crop rotation, and marketing. Marketing work, marketing of the product. Yes. I give you an example. The islands of Eleuthera, Abaco, Cat Island, Exoma, and the island that I came from, Meguana. Mm -hmm. They all have to send the produce to New Providence by inter-island mail. And when uh, a level of farming became uh, successful, everybody was growing watermelon at the same time or whatever product. And they were all sending it to the capital at the same time. And if you went to the farmer's market or you went down to the dock when the boats came in, all of those people produce were all over the ground. They, oh. they, it was not properly Marketed, properly stored, and staggering uh, what to grow. Everybody's growing the same thing at the same time. We just didn't have the capacity. So uh, there was a lot of lip service, but there wasn't a lot of um, scientific application of the of what it means to have a successful food production machinery. Yeah, gotcha. Sounds like the same across the board. So, <laughs> thank you for that. You're welcome. Can I make a, just a very quick input um, based on what the ambassador has said? Um, I think what one of the things that we need to, uh, you know, we're talking about we're in the time of COVID. And I think it's, it's fairly, you know, I mean, I have been inundated and probably you all have been with different uh, um, videos and things that come to us, they bombard us, you know, um, some of them are humorous, some of them are not so humorous. What can we do in terms of stimulating even the youths who are non-agriculturally inclined? You know, we can have some, some, some videos that are out there on, on through uh, Instagram and YouTube and, you know, some things on television, bombard their minds. They can get outside and do certain things in their own yard. And who knows, you know, you think about the millions of dollars that people get during election time are giving $15, you yeah. know. And it, so in a small way, each, if each individual contributes even to their own backyard, when they cut their grass and they put that grass back into their soil, they enrich the soil. So where you have poor soil type, you can enrich the soil. I have done this. This is a personal experience. Yes. And you'd be surprised to see how things grow. And it helps to you know, it, it keeps us mentally, you know, in tune so that even some of the mental fatigue that we have by being at a home, it will help to ease all of that. There are so many things we could do, you know. Absolutely. And um, even when we talk about technology, Dr. Webb, yeah. involving uh, the youths with, and engaging them in a way that allows for them to use the technology. And yes. also, um, Dr. S um, S Ambassador Colley spoke to marketing. And I have one of my um, colleagues on today who is one of the best communications artists that I um, know of, who can tell you just about how we might be able to market just about anything. So if we, have, we are able to grow some of the best food in the Caribbean, why is it that we don't know what a mango does first, but we know what an apple does a day? We must manage ourselves better. And it is important that we have these conversations in a way 
not only just to talk about it, but to do something about it as we as we leave, as we go on to our other, you know, uh, what we must do. It isn't so that we just point to what the problem is. For me, it's really, really important that we address it in a way that changes it in the future. It is our lives that depend on it. If we were to consider that it is possible that we would not be able to get food from the US, which is um, where we import 80% of our food from. Suppose that can't get to us. And that's a, not a very far off support, um, supposition. It is something that we must address. So for me, I would wish and hope that we would address it before people start starving. It's at that place. If I can comment on Dr. Webb's observations, she's so right. Um, Young people drive around the Midwest, uh, uh, most, most of our Caribbean young people who get higher education at one point or another in their life, they're visiting the United States. We are never going to get the food production that you get in Iowa or in the Midwest or anywhere else. We're simply in the Caribbean too far behind, uh, lack of uh, financial resources and lack of capacity. So it is unrealistic for our people to shoot for the kind of farms and production and implements and, and the technology that you get in the United States and Canada and in Europe. We are small islands. Some of us like Jamaica and Guyana and Belize and some of the smaller Eastern Caribbean islands are very good soil, but very small acreage. And so for those farmers who have a couple of acres that they can uh, cultivate, uh, we, we ought to do all we can to assist them in financial resources, in education, and in labor. But Dr. Well put his finger on it. There's so much more that can be done with the backyard farming. And I must tell you, since COVID, uh, I have done some backyard farming at my home in Nassau, as well as here in DC. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing what is in my backyard right now. I have sweet peppers, I have squash, I have tomatoes. I have the tomatoes growing in the big containers and they're loaded. Mm -hmm. And in my, in my backyard in the Bahamas, I have lots of uh, citrus. And, uh, you know, in, in the Caribbean, we have a lot of the fruit, the, 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 the cultural fruits. Uh, and, you, and you can, instead of planting crabgrass and the beautiful trees, uh, use that space and plant something that produce a fruit, that produce a crop. So that, that, that is for, for homeowners and for persons who have access to that. That's, that's a natural. It doesn't take that much to do. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And that is so true. Like in Jamaica, we say, eat, grow what we eat, eat what we grow. Yes. That's very right. vital. So, and I do have a garden and I've been eating a lot of tomatoes also. So it's very important. Um, we encourage that backyard gardening is also very critical. Um, as we continue the program, um, we have the J Patty from Rhode Island, and um, they will be doing a presentation on their um, commitment to the diaspora right there in, in Rhode Island. And I'll hand it over to Conroy and Allison. Yes. Hi, yes, my name is Conroy Otar. Uh, unfortunately, Allison, um, it's tied up into a business meeting, so we won't be able to attend um, tonight's Zoom meeting. But um, uh, here at Japati, uh, we are committed to um, the cause, and uh, one of the ways that we are contribution um, is um, healthy farm-to-table uh, preparation of food. And in one in particular is our our, our patties that we uh, kind of redesigned the. Um, the, the carbs and the protein um, ratio uh, to get to deliver a more healthier patty and um, to, um, to extrapolate a little bit on that is that um, 
I recall, like, for example, myself and my dad were diabetic. And uh, one of the things that I realized as a chef and a food business owner is that in the Caribbean, uh, we eat a lot of um, a lot of starch, a lot of carbs that, you know, that contributes to high di diabetes. So one of the things that we, um, at Japati, we even though we produce Jamaican food and we still make it flavorful, we concentrate on um, the amount of carbs that we serve uh, sourcing quality product and uh, having a balanced ratio in how we prepare our meals. So that's one of the things that um, set us apart from the other uh, food incubators here in Providence and what we're known for is our healthier version of the Caribbean food. And in particular, in um, folks on folks from the Caribbean that are, um, that are susceptible to having diabetes, like myself. So um, having uh, sourcing sourcing um, healthy uh, uh, product and cooking it in health the most stays the way is one of the um, it's one of our drive in contributing to um, the healthy food eating for the Caribbean so uh, that is our mission thank you very much um, Jay Paddy I know time is against us so we're going to move right into, and you spoke about it, nutrition. Um, we're so happy to have with us Sonia Grant, M-A-R-D-N and C-D-N, who will be presenting to us on nutrition. And um, let's not forget about the herbs also. So... Ms. Grant, you have the floor. Unmute, Ms. Grant. <laughs> Unmute, Ms. Grant. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for having me on this program. And um, you bear with me a little bit. I am not very savvy with the technology. So, yes, um, I have been listening to um, those who spoke before me, and you all have hit the nail right on the head with um, the ideas, especially um, that Miss um, Food Warrior. And I, I want to say thank you to her for um, trying to do such a wonderful job in New York. I wish I knew about her program when I was in New York. So, you know, but I ask that she continue to do the good work that Thank you. she is she's doing there. Um, so today we are gonna be just talking about, continue talking about food security as we've been doing. And for the purpose of um, my discussion this evening, I want to describe food security as um, all members of a household having access at all times to a variety of enough and nutritious food so that they can prepare balanced meals that will nourish them and help them to live active lifestyle. If you're not food secure, then you know it, it is not um, easy to get food. Being food secure means that people in all cultures any country should be able to shop for quality, nutritious food, and they won't have to go out to seek for emergency food sources or to steal food or to depend on family members to give them food. So over the years, many people have experienced food security for various reasons. And this has caused hunger and malnutrition related diseases for example, in, 20, in 2006, it was reported that globally 70,000 children die of hunger and malnutrition-related diseases every year, which equals to about 6 million children who die of hunger. Out of one out of six children, roughly a million in developed countries are, are underweight, which is not acceptable. So, when all this happens, we look at this as being poor nutrition. And poor nutrition 
because nearly half or about 45% of deaths in children under five. This 3.1 million children each year. And that is a large number of people, of children to be dying from not having enough food. The vast majority of Congo people, about 820 million, live in developing countries like the regions in which we live. That's about 14.3% of these people are undernourished. Today, in the, in, in the era of COVID pandemic, it, it's impacting vulnerable households in various ways, making it difficult for families to be food secure. And this is related to loss of jobs, food shortages, and government lockdown. Many people are at very high risk of becoming food insecure. And this includes the healthcare workers who are, are really the warriors in taking care of those who are sick. There's the entertainment industry, and then there's the hospitality industry workers. These people are at higher risk of becoming food insecure before they, they were able to find their own food. But with the lockdown and everything, it has become more difficult for them. Research has shown that in America, due to COVID, it may become possible that unemployment and poverty may increase to the level of great, the Great Recession, where 10.6 million more people may experience food insecurity. In a more extreme scenario, the number of food secure, of insecure individuals could rise by 17.1 million. Demand for charitable food assistance has increased and is expected to continue to increase for the foreseeable future. Individuals are at a high risk for severe illness associated with COVID-19, as they may not be able to get enough quality food to eat. Food security affects every one of us in some way or another. Eating foods that are nutritionally deficient will contribute to malnutrition and problems of chronic non-communicable diseases which currently plague the Caribbean region. It is also noteworthy that persons with these non-communicable diseases are among the most vulnerable to the effects of the COVID disease. Let me talk about diet and health. Good eating is essential for good health. Therefore, it is imperative that households get enough quality food that is divided equally among the members within the household and that the food provides the nutrition needs of all members of the household. But in the era of COVID-19, good eating has been affected due to such factors, such as the declining economies. We have seen that during all this COVID time. Economies are, are, are not able to function as they used to. High cost of food, loss of job, unavailability of food, Food banks are reporting increased demand and operating challenges. Government demanding for social distances and the lockdown regulation. One of the primary sources of food supply, as mentioned by Ms. Burnett, is the United States. So previously it was predicted that there's a potential for improvement in food security over the next Ten, over the next decade in our region. But now there's a shift in the paradigm due to COVID. Increased risk of food security for the Caribbean is now what we're looking at due to this, um, this pandemic. The impact on food supply means that in the, in the time of crisis, we are at greater risk if shipping lines, global supply chains, exporters abroad and importers domestically are, are affected. And we've also seen this as we face what's going on in, in the pandemic. Primary source of, foreign, of, um, of our financial um, gain in, in, in the Caribbean is mostly from travel, tourism, and remittances. These are key economic income for our foreign exchange earners in the Caribbean and is being seriously affected by the pan pandemic and is at high risk of temporarily shutting down. The Caribbean impact reports that 
The pandemic has created multiple socioeconomic challenges simultaneously throughout the region. And then we have Marla Jokaran, a Caribbean economist and advisor. She says that this includes health crisis, sudden stop of economic activity, weak investor confidence, exchange rate volatility, and low remittance inflow. All these will affect our financial or have a serious financial indication. It is also reported that in Jamaica alone, the tourism, sec the tourism sector accounts for 58% of all foreign exchange earnings. So we can just imagine with um, the country shutting down and um, not being able to accommodate tourism as much as we used to, how this is going to affect us financially. Marla also predicts that in a COVID-19 worst case scenario, the Caribbean region could lose up to 83% of its tourism earnings on average, which could hurt reserves and significantly impact those countries with high agricultural trade deficits. Over the years, there has been a shift from agriculture, as we've been talking about so far tonight, that people have shifted from um, the agriculture, which was a high source of income, and now we are depending on tourism and remittances. This has caused a decline in the agricultural sector, an increase in food import bills. As COVID impacts food supply in countries, which the Caribbean depend on, such as the United States, as a source of their food supply. It is likely that they will be unable to provide the amount of food needed for the Caribbean to remain food secure during these times. And how are we going to address this problem? Unless local food production is increased to fill the void left by reducing ports, problems related to malnutrition caused by insufficient food are likely to arise if the food shortages last for a prolonged period of time. Local farmers, like we've been saying, will have to step up to the plate to fill the void of food security if this time of crisis continues. Consumers will have to show more resilience. Private sector and government will have to do their part in taking action to ensure that food supply is available to the nation. Education will be key in getting people to understand the importance of avoiding waste as well as using locally grown produce to create healthy meals. Unless local food production is increased to fill the void left by, left by um, reduced imports, the problem related to malnutrition, um, I think I um, kind of went over that before. In other words, we should promote the use of local production by farmers and backyard gardens. That has been the theme so far in our discussion today. The Ministry of Agriculture should ensure that seeds, seedlings, and fertilizers are made available to those food producers in, in sufficient quantities to get the job done. While this is being done, the problem of previous larceny needs to be addressed, as this can be a deterrent to farmers. Immediate action is needed for the most vulnerable, such as school children, because if schools are closed down, where some of these kids get their main meal, one main meal a day, then they are at risk of um, suffering from this pandemic and nutritional deficiency. The elderly and the shut-in are another set that we really need to pay attention to right now. And the unemployed who has no fund to purchase food. Politicians in their districts should consider temporary means to put in place food delivery system to deliver meals to the affected households. Government can institute cash transfers to people, people, persons who are unemployed or who are not able to work because of the poor closure of their businesses due to mandate by governments in an effort to contain the virus. Now, um, with all this that's happening, People continue to innovate, people continue to experience food shortages. Many are looking to alternative ways of preventing or healing COVID-19. So they are, they are fearful 
And when one, when people are fearful, fear will cause people to try anything to avoid going to the hospital. So many people turn to herbal remedies. And we know herbal remedies have long been used to treat infections and viruses such as cold, the common cold, influenza, fever, and even herpes. But alternative and, and um, herbal remedies, remedies, we have to look to um, be careful. People claim that herbal remedies have kept them healthy or improved their symptoms with COVID-19. COVID but the bulk of research on herb is inconclusive. Health experts warn that we don't have enough data to support the use of herbal remedies for COVID-19. So not be just because we've seen promises, so seen some promise with such illnesses, doesn't mean that people should assume herbal remedies provide the same benefit with COVID-19. Though herbal remedies may seem harmless, if misused, they could increase a person's risk for COVID-19. We may find that certain herbs are effective in preventing and treating COVID-19 in some people, but there are currently, but there currently isn't enough data regarding the use of herbal remedies for the new coronavirus. Herbs may certainly be helpful, but exactly which ones and how much and what presentation pattern or permutation is not well defined. Research has also been somewhat inconsistent. There are so many parts of a plant, the root, the stem, the leaf, the flower, and it's hard to get studies that consistently analyze the same portion of a plant. There could be unwanted side effects if these are used. Just like any other medicine, herbal remedies could cause adverse side effects. Certain herbs, if misused, could boost the immune system even more and lead to a cytokine storm, storm or a fatal overreaction of the immune system. So we talk about caution. Based on the available data, as noted above, making health claims for herbal treatments at this time could violate the FDA rules and could be viewed negatively according to one report. So consumers can be encouraged though to practice with caution the use of herbal products which are proven to be safe. For example, aloe vera, and we know that's common in the Caribbean, ginger, garlic, and turmeric, just to name a few. And then there are the fresh fruits that, um, especially grown in the Caribbean, like oranges, tangerine, pineapples, lemons, lime, which are high in vitamin C, which is um, one of the things that will help boost the immune system. And so we have vitamin supplements such as vitamin C, B complex, vitamin E, vitamin D3, which we can get from the sun, which is of no shortage in, in the Caribbean. And then we also encourage physical activities and breathing exercises which will help to um, with the lung. So I have here uh, a little home, suggested home COVID kit, which if people keep this together and should they be infected, then they could help themselves before, or maybe they wouldn't have to get to the hospital. They could have medications as indicated by a doctor that will help pain if they're suffering from that. Then there's lemon limes that they can use for mouthwash and gargle. And they should have um, vitamin C about a thousand milligrams, vitamin E, and then there's vitamin D. Again, um, you can get those to buy in the care of them. They will need to buy those because they have the sun just sitting it for uh, like 15 to 20 minutes. And then some items that they can keep for steaming the face are like the lemon and the garlic. So we know COVID comes in three stages. And if it's in your nose, some steaming with some of the things I mentioned before could help to um, alleviate that. And then in the throat, if you have a sore throat, hot water gargle or to drink just keep sipping on warm water, maybe put a little bit of lime or lemon in it. That will also help um, with the, the sore throat. 
um, then you take some vitamin C, and um, if there's a severe case, then maybe you want to go to the doctor, and the doctor might recommend some kind of antibiotics. So, so we know that lemon helps to eliminate the virus in the throat before it reaches the lungs, and we know that's where it becomes really dangerous. Now, if it gets to the lungs, coughing and breathlessness is what most people um, will experience. So we're, we recommend no cold meals, that you drink a lot of fluids, about 1.5 liters a day, and um, deep breathing exercises, and this should um, help if it gets worse, you should definitely go to the hospital and, or speak with your doctor. What are the take home messages from this? Education, consumer education is key. Clear messages should be sent to the public regarding the availability of food to prevent panic buying and hoarding, which may contribute to price increase and food insecurity. To promote alternative food sources where there is scarcity, we should also educate people to reinforce healthy consumption habits and to promote healthy practices such as proper hand washing and washing of fruits and vegetables. Most importantly, stay safe by following the guidelines, wear your mask, proper hygiene, healthy eating, and caution on the use of herbal alternative medicines. Thank you very much. Excellent present presentation. Okay. Um, and if anybody has any questions. Colette? Is Grandson? I, um, if I may jump in, uh, I thought that presentation uh, was excellent and it covers so much in the age of COVID. My question is, uh, you talk about a balanced diet and, and, and nutrition, um, but the younger generation don't go in the kitchen anymore to cook. Definitely, that's, that's true. They, um, they just, uh, and I have two, one teenage daughter and a, and a young adult, and um, I'm constantly fighting with getting them out. I go in the kitchen and I love to cook, but they want to go out or order out. Uh, and what is your view on, I know there are some restaurants where they, they pay attention to calories and to portions and everything else, but generally ordering out as opposed to cooking your own food. What's your view? I, I think it is more important that we cook at home, but these days parents are so busy that they hardly cook at home. And so the kids themselves don't know how to cook. So what, what, I, what I, I, I recommend that if people have to eat out is that you teach them how to select, to make healthy choices when they go out. And for those who are cooking at home is that we teach simple meals. The kids learn to make simple meals you know, that are not high in fat or whatever, that might help a little bit. But mainly if we teach them how to make healthy selections if they have to eat out, it's probably, you know, one of the ways we can get them to eat healthy and nutritious. I want to make a little input here. Um, I, I, I find it, uh, thank you, Ms. Grant, for a wonderful presentation. Um, you know, Again, we're talking about COVID and my mind always goes outside of the box, so you have to forgive me. But really, when you think of it, um, you talk about cooking. You know, this is an opportunity with COVID where people can begin to learn to cook. I mean, it's, think of it, they're at home. And so these are some of the things that can help to relieve the mental strain. People complain about wanting to get out there because they, are, they feel pent up in their homes. Well, this is a good way to deal with it. Start to learn to cook. There are recipes you can find on YouTube. You could find some of the things you said. And if we did that, little by little, we can find that it can transform our entire minds and our lives and can even add to sustainability in our, uh, in our countries because we could be become, you know, you talk about the fact that, you know, um, people, 
are not cooking as much. Well, interestingly, I'm in Alabama. And interestingly, when the COVID began, there was a shortage of food supplies because people began to cook more at home. <laughs> so, so you see, it's, 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 it's interesting. And, and when we asked the question, they said, well, more people were buying different foodstuffs. And of course, you know, people love to eat out, as you know. But people right. began realizing that they were confined to their homes. They began to make little things and they enjoyed it, you know. And, and, and this is where, um, it, with the backyard gardening, this is where it comes in that they will learn to use what they grow to cook. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes, like um, when I was up in New York, I used to have a little backyard gardening mm -hmm. and my granddaughter loves to cook. She's like 10 years old and she loves to cook, but she hates the gardening. She would never <laughs> do that. But then when you show her what she could do with what she made, you know, it was very, very good. So, you know, if we incorporate things like that, I think it will be, be very good. And I wanted to make a comment on um, Ms. what Ms. Barnett was saying and um, um, Ambassador Kali about uh, um, teaching people with the agriculture and how we have moved from that to something else. And I think what has happened is that we've moved it out of the schools. Mm -hmm. And because that has happened, the children, it's like another subject. That's what it used to be, like another subject. So you had to go to your garden and you had to go to your home economics class where you are taught to cook maybe what was going in the garden, but that has moved away. So the work that Ms. Barnett is doing is, um, it's very, very important that she has started in the school because getting, you know, the children interested will eventually be, they're going to be the adults of tomorrow who will probably carry that practice on. Thank you, Ms. Grant. That is so true. And um, I really admire what you, um, you shared with us today because generally I'm like the canary in the coal mine, just screaming that we really need to take care of this and we really need to get our young people involved. But I hear your passion as much for it. And I really appreciate that as well because it is people like you and the information that you shared that is gonna change things. Um, Ambassador Collie, you mentioned talking about, you spoke a little bit about your young people. I have a 19 year old at my house and he initially hated to cook, loved to eat though. Um, COVID, every opportunity, every challenge creates an opportunity. So now my 19 year old cooks and he cooks just every single meal that he eats now. He tells me he's a chef. So <laughs> it is possible that we can have shift it is, doing impossible. it is also important that we make that happen, that we encourage it as much as we can with all that we do, both as we are doing it, also as we're speaking it, that it is that we embody it. I think it changes things. And, uh, you know, my wife who lives in the Bahamas uh, got caught twice here. She's here now. I have a, a housekeeper and my daughter and a, and a friend. And we get in the kitchen and it's a big deal. We all get around the aisle and everybody is a portion, a task, and we all contribute to the meal. And it's a joy. Uh, it, it's so amazing, Dr. Webb, uh, that you mentioned that because it, it not only brings the family together, but it, it's a special kind of community. Yes, yes that, definitely. That, that many of us, with our fast lives and our busy lives uh, before COVID probably missed out on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. We have a question from Jean from Root Library and Foundation. Jean, you could go ahead. Thank you, Ambassador. Hi, good evening, everyone, again. Uh, just kind of piggybacking on the idea of young people not cooking and possibly not engaging in um, gardening. I think we are not giving them enough credit. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with over 200 international students um, from different Caribbean islands that we were trying to help during COVID-19. And uh, many of them, if not all of them, were very engaged in their kitchens, uh, cooking food, sharing recipes, even trying to find out different recipes from different Caribbean islands. 
Um, they were even searching for home remedies uh, for the cold or the flu. And we, you know, kind of passed on some of our old time remedies to them. So um, I say that to say, we, we can't discount what the young people are doing. We just have to encourage them. They're more so into um, social media. So maybe like engaging them with uh, challenges such as, I mean, cooking challenges or creating a garden or even planting something in their, their dorm rooms. They like that. They like social media and challenges. So maybe engaging them in that way might help. That's a great idea. Excellent. Anyone else has any question for um, Ms. Grant? Well, it was great. What a great event. Um, Colette, it's amazing to partner with you on such a dear topic um, for me. I know in Jamaica, um, that was one thing that my grandparents, we never went out to buy food. Grandfather would come in with the big hamper basket full of goods from the farm. Yeah. And in your own backyard, we had pear tree, we had mango tree, we had so many stuff. And being able, and I think that's where I got my green thumb from my grandfather. Yeah. And it came up into the line. My mom has a green thumb. My sister has a green thumb. So, <laughs> you know, that could... Yes. <laughs> so um, it's, it's, it's very important. And I think regionally, as we look at how the diaspora can assist the, the region and the youths, I mean, there are so many new technology out there that we can use in the farming um, how we can impart that in the region to better our farming, better our irrigation, and all of that. Um, so we close it out and say, where do we go from here? I'll let you have the floor. Where do we go from here? And we let's not forget October the 16th is World Food Day. So we are going to continue the discussion on that day. Colette, go ahead. I think we first need to create a space where we can collect it, can collect our information, share best practices, and really create a community that is that spearheads agriculture in a way that allows for it to truly change. If we can do that in our region, there will be change along the in all of our islands would see change as a result. The answers are already in the room. We just need to aggregate them. And it is extremely important that we stay buoyed that each one of us here don't lose our gumption or our courage as we walk with what we wanna see show up in the world. I think COVID-19 truly allows for an opportunity that would not have been had it not arrived, but it is here now and it is possible for us to really shift if it is our intent. So for me, it is to encourage each person on that is within the sound of my voice to continue to work really hard at creating opportunities for our young people and for ourselves to eat more healthy so we can have better lives. Thank you. Thank you. One minute, Dr. Webb, where do we go from here? And then Sonia will have you close off. Where do we go from here? Uh, I would just simply say that COVID-19 has actually created positive pos possibilities. Um, we, I think our focus needs to be, again, on trying to encourage um, more so the young, because they are the ones who I think if we can generate the excitement, uh, we can eventually get somewhere. And perhaps one of the ways would be to look at opportunities, for instance, why not have some sort of, they're pretty good in technology, why not have them share some of their, their results from their, kitchen, their backyard gardens, you know, and eventually have a competition and, you know, sort of give somebody a prize and, you know, and then share that, you know, with the wider community with it. And, and eventually, who knows, we may be able to get partners who can give us some funding to help them now and, and begin to expand. We, I, I started about speaking about micro enterprises. 
that could be a way of how it could mushroom into you know entrepreneurship and so forth and see the youths get excited and our countries uh, better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Webb. And last but least, Ms. Grant, where do we go from here? So go, moving forward, um, we have to be prepared for crisis that we know is going to happen one way or another somewhere along the line. And if we become more self-sufficient in, in, in our region, where we have our own food and we teach our kids how to, um, I would say, my grandmother would say, on your hand, drop how you want to make fashion. So they can use um, food from the, the kitchen, like the scraps that um, we talked about earlier. Uh, you cut your kalalu and you plant a piece of the stem mm -hmm. that will grow and then you use that. So the key is getting the children prepared and getting our governments and everybody interested in making ourselves more sufficient. And that way we can teach our kids to do nutritious meals from what they have grown in their own backyard or in our own country. Excellent. We're so happy. I know there was one question that um, someone wanted to ask, but because of time constraint, um, she was asking about um, the import um, bill, but we'll, we will address this in our next series um, on World Food Day, October the 16th, where we're going to look at it again and look at you know, where the region stand, where COVID is, and um, dive deeper into the discussion. And I'm looking forward to partner with um, Colette, Global Food Warrior. Love the name, Colette. It's amazing. Thank and you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Webb, um, for your presentation. Well put together, wealth of information. Um, Ms. Sonia Grant, excellent presentation on the way the nutrition is important to us and how thank it will you. affect us, um, especially in COVID. Um, we don't know how long COVID is going to be with us. And uh, there is many rocky roads ahead of us. So we need to prepare ourselves and take action. And we're so happy we're here in the diaspora, the Caribbean diaspora organization like mine, Colette, and um, Jean from um, Root Library and Foundation, and many other partners in the diaspora we're doing a tremendous job to, you know, provide for our community both locally and also see how we can assist the Caribbean region with the resources that we have here in the diaspora. And we want to say thanks to the ambassadors, Ambassador Coley. We, we appreciate your support, continued support for the diaspora. Um, thanks for the Embassy of Trinidad, um, Ambassador Philip Spencer and uh, the representative from the embassy, um, right? We're really happy for your support and all the other ambassadors who have supported. It's, it's now important that we strengthen the engagement to move forward to build a strong Caribbean with the efforts of the diaspora. As we say, we love home. And I know one day as a CARICOM member, I am looking forward to being Bimini on the beach having a good time. <laughs> because up here it's not getting warmer, you know, and with climate change, we don't know what to expect. So it's yeah. good to, to help to build a strong region, very important. And um, I thank you very, very much. I must thank our Facebook viewer who are watching. And keep tuned to the Authentic Caribbean Foundation as we continue to educate, we continue to advance and advocate for the interests of the Caribbean American diaspora and the Caribbean region. Thank you all for attending this wonderful event. And as we say in the islands, walk good. Walk keep, good. keep wearing your mask. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.
Take care, guys. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.